Good morning, and thank you for joining us for this briefing. Once again, interpreter Margie Propp is here to help with sign language, and we appreciate your services, Margie. Before we begin our discussion of the latest COVID-19 information, uh, we once again want to thank the community for their outpouring of love and support that they've shown in response to the shooting of LPD investigator Mario Herrera. He continues to be in critical condition at UNMC, and we want to thank the medical staff there for their care and compassion as they tend to his wounds. Yesterday afternoon, the Nebraska Community Blood Bank reported that more than 400 units of blood have been donated, 80 of those donations from first-time donors. And at last count, 300 appointments for donations were scheduled for the coming days. And support doesn't stop there. Support is coming in uh, not just from Lincoln, but from Omaha, across the state, and even across our nation. Uh, the Herrera family posted in its Caring Bridge journal that there are prayer groups in Israel praying for Mario. There are also countless expressions of hope for his healing from all over the country. We want to thank all of you who are supporting Mario and his family during this difficult time. And we join all of those in sending our heartfelt wishes for his full recovery. As we work together to protect the health and safety of everyone in our community during this pandemic, we remind everyone to access our latest information at our website, covid19.lincoln.ne.gov. Uh, there you will find our dashboard, and we update that dashboard daily each afternoon. At that website, you also find our COVID-19 risk dial, a color-coded tool that communicates the risk level for COVID-19 transmission in Lincoln and Lancaster County. Last week, the dial moved back to orange, signifying that the risk of the virus spreading in our community is high. The change to high risk is due in large part to the fact that our community is in a period of significant adjustment. Schools throughout Lincoln and Lancaster County are back open for the first time since March. Thousands of college students from across the country are back on campus. Social activities are a central part of the college experience, so a jump in the number of new cases was somewhat expected. Still, with new positive cases uh, comes an in increased concern about managing transmission of the virus. The choices that students make could have a dramatic impact on our community and our progress here in the pandemic. On Monday, Lincoln and Lancaster County had 93 new cases reported, the highest daily total reported since the pandemic began. Make no mistake, Lincoln is honored to be the home of UNL and the other universities and colleges here in our community. We love having students here and we want them to feel at home here. We ask that our students reflect on the fact that they are now part of a larger community, a community that is also home to thousands of people for whom COVID-19 presents a serious threat to their health and even to their lives. We ask students to recognize that what happens on campus does not necessarily stay on campus. And truth be told, if the virus were to take hold in our community in an unmanageable way, students may not be able to stay on campus either. No one wants things to shut down. No one wants students to be sent home. And everyone has real power to prevent that from happening. In order to keep our schools and colleges open and to protect our community, we all must do our part to keep ourselves and others safe. The cost to wear a mask, to wash our hands, and to watch our distance from others is very low, while the cost of not practicing these common sense steps is very high. Let's be all in. Let's be greater than this virus. The invisible opponent we face this fall is ready to take advantage of weaknesses in our lineup in the end, it will depend on each of us to decide whether we want to go big or go home. We won't have today's case count until mid-afternoon today. So at this time, we report that the total number of lab-confirmed cases in Lincoln and Lancaster County now stands at 4,117. This graph shows the recent jump in case numbers. And for the week ending August 29th, we had 338 new cases, the second highest weekly total. 166 of the new cases, or about 50%, were individuals connected to UNL. Health Director Pat Lopez is here to provide more information about our increasing caseload, and then we are very pleased to welcome back UNL Chancellor Ronnie Green. Over to you, Director Lopez.
Thank you, Mayor. In addition to the increase in case numbers, the average weekly positivity rate also went up from 6.7% the week ending August 22nd to 10.5% the week ending August 29th. The increase is largely due to the uh, increased testing of college students who are at a higher risk of contracting the virus due to their social activities. Testing done over the past two weeks has shown 20 a uh, 20 percent positivity rate among those living in on-campus dormitories and a 35 percent positivity rate among sororities and fraternities at UNL. Greek housing tends to have students living in closer quarters and involved in more routine social events than those living in the dorm setting. If we do see a cluster of cases in the dorm or on a floor of the dorms, the same action will be taken to quarantine students in that dorm, just as we have done with the Greek housing. Today, contact tracing has not confirmed any in-classroom transmission of the virus in any school or college campus in Lancaster County. The data shows that our educational institutions are doing a great job with the prevention strategies they have implemented in the school and classroom settings. It is truly the activities that students and their families participate in outside of the school setting that are contributing to the increase in new cases. All testing results are received by the health department no matter whether the testing is completed on campus or off campus or any number of facilities. We are working, also working with Union College, Wesleyan, and Southeast Community College to monitor new cases. To date, we have identified 28 cases associated with Wesleyan. As further investigations are completed, we will have more information related to the other area colleges. Most students are cooperative with contact tracers, providing information to help contain the spread of the virus. However, we need to remind students that they need to follow the policies in place to protect themselves and the entire system if they want to continue to have school and be on campus. Schools have taken the appropriate measures to prevent and mitigate the spread of the virus. Now it's up to the students to do the same. The health department meets daily with the UNL officials and continues to be in close contact with other schools and colleges. I want to thank Chancellor Green for working so closely with our health department to keep our students and our community safe. I'd like to welcome Chancellor Green. Well, thank you very much, Mayor and Director Lopez. It's um, good to be here today and to have a chance to also uh, reaffirm the, the uh, success that we're having at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln with our return to school this year. Uh, we started classes um, on August the 17th at UNL. That first week of classes were all remote as students returned back to Lincoln from, from across the world. Uh, began in-person instruction on campus on August the 24th. So we're now on our eighth day today of in-person instruction at UNL. Uh, to put some context around our community, uh, we have just over 25,000 students registered with us today. Uh, our enrollment is actually up. We're very pleased about that. Um, that in a time of a pandemic, we, are, we have increased enrollment at the university, and we have about 6,300 employees uh, of our faculty and staff at the university. So a community of over 31,000 people here uh, that make up UNL. Public health has been our number one priority in uh, returning to the school year this year. Uh, we have worked very, very carefully and closely with uh, the Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department, as Director Lopez said, and are doing so on a continuing basis in a wonderful partnership with them. Um, so it, uh, we, we are pleased with the strategies that have been put in place, and as Director Lopez said, we have had no transmission in class or on campus of COVID-19 to this point. So we're very, very pleased about that. We do also recognize the caseloads. So as we have 
uh, entered into our testing with partners that started on August the 12th on campus. Uh, we now uh, have, as of yesterday, 225 confirmed positive tests during that period of time from all sources. Uh, it, it is true that, as Director Lopez said, we have had a greater prevalence of positive tests in our Greek organization houses on campus. Uh, some 37% of our positive test results have been in those houses and we've, uh, we have adopted and put in place quarantine strategy in order to mitigate that risk and that is working. Uh, as we said earlier, uh, we also would do the same irregardless of where that might be. If there was a floor of a dormitory or another portion of the campus that would need to have that same strategy, uh, it would be deployed. We also are in the process with our partners of increasing testing. Uh, we both have done that over the last week as more tests have been needed or in demand through our testing service, we have done that and are increasing that capacity as we also are looking forward to in the coming week implementing prevalence testing as another risk and safeguard on our campus uh, as we move forward. So uh, I would also appeal in the same way that the mayor did earlier, we are all doing our part we are all working hard to uh, implement the safety procedures that are in place. I've been very proud of our campus for how they have approached this and, and done that. And we, we know that we need to continue doing so in order for us all to be uh, in a safe and successful semester. So I'll turn it back over to, to Director Lopez, uh, who will moderate some questions. Thank you, Chancellor Green. I want to share some additional information with you. We also have had an increase in cases at the state penitentiary. In addition to those cases among the uh, college student population, we have been seeing this increase in cases uh, at the state pen, which now has 29 case confirmed cases here in Lincoln. Uh, that has added to our current caseload of numbers. Measures have uh, been put in place to prevent the per further uh, spread of the virus there, and that also has included suspending visits and quarantining inmates. In the rail yard, uh, we also, I also wanted to address some of the complaints we have received about social activities over the weekend. In particular, a photo taken at the rail yard has raised concerns about possible violations of the directed health measure. The health department is currently investigating that situation as well as other complaints. If violations have occurred, appropriate action will be taken, including the issuance of warnings and or citations. We continue to work with our local businesses with guidance and mitigation strategies to best protect their employees and customers. Most businesses are doing a great job with prevention measures and contributing to the health of our community. We encourage everyone to frequent businesses that have measures in place to prevent the spread of the virus to keep you and your family safe. Physical distancing and wearing masks will get us to the other side of this pandemic. As we announced Friday, the local directed health measure that was put in place August 31st will remain in effect through September 30th. The directed health measure does include the mask mandate. You will find the latest directed health measure posted at covid19.lincoln.ne.gov. We will be making some adjustments to our local directed health measure that will be effective September 14th. Those changes will clarify that Lancaster County does not intend to move into phase four this month. With local cases uh, numbers on the rise and with the new circumstances we face as schools, colleges, and universities resume classes, this is the time not only to stay the course, but also to redouble our efforts in Lancaster County. We need to do what is best for our community to overcome the impact of this virus. Thank you, Director Lopez, and thank you so much, Chancellor Green. 
I think what we want to communicate above all today is how close the working relationships are in this community. Our health team, the university, working hand in hand day after day, not literally touching hands of course, but working together to embrace our community uh, in a safe protection that will help us get through this together. Um, but we ask for your help. Please support and be a part of that network of safety and protection. We all have the power to do this. And it's really just common sense strategies, washing your hands, wearing your mask, and watching your distance, um, nudging each other towards success. Um, we all have this role to play if we wanna get through to the other side of the pandemic more quickly, and we'll do it more quickly together. With that, we'd like to open up the briefing for questions. Riley with the Journal Star. Hi, Riley. How'd you enjoy that scooter um, ride? <laughs> very well, very well. Um, I'll start with my question for you. Um, there's there um, today in my column, um, a bar owner had told me a little bit about the dilemma that they face, um, where everyone in their industry has rents to pay. It's a time when there's still some hesitancy for people to go out, and yet. Um, they have to kind of try and get people in the door to get the revenue to pay their bills. Um, is the city or, or what measures do you think is appropriate from the city um, to sort of help them alleviate the pressure to pack their businesses in order to, you know, stay afloat? Thanks for that question, Riley. First off, I would say that across the country and around the globe, most bars are closed. They are one of the most um, challenging sources and likely sources of spread of COVID-19. Why? Because people stay for long periods of time in close proximity. You have to remove your mask to have a drink. If it's loud and noisy with music, you raise your voices and you spread aerosol potentially that contributes to the transmission of COVID-19. And of course, the more alcohol that's consumed, the more chances for impaired judgment and a failure to make those good choices that keep ourselves and others safe. So we know bars are really high risk locations for the spread of COVID-19. But even with that knowledge, our local health team has worked incredibly hard with our bar owners to try to support them to be open in a safe manner because we know that those are jobs in our community. We know that livelihoods are at stake. One of the things that we undertook early on in the pandemic is our Dine Out Lincoln program. We are trying to innovate in the midst of the uncertainty of this time and that innovation is meant to allow bar owners to try to expand into their outdoor spaces where possible so that they can increase capacity without increasing their density. That is one of our efforts. Um, you know, the other options that we face if we can't get more community compliance with directed health measures is to eventually have to shut down those bars because at, many will say it's a choice between bars and schools. That is the cold, hard fact of, of life across the country and around the globe. We are trying to thread the needle in a way that, that accomplishes both. We know that this is really a challenging time for them, and we'll continue to work with them. If, if there are individual um, business owners who need help, who want to know what they can do to try to be as successful as possible, our team will go out, our environmental health team will go out and work with them on their plans. And that's part of the reason why we're asking everyone to take these common sense practices so seriously, because when you're wearing masks and watching your distance and washing your hands, the, the risk of transmission goes way down. And if we can keep the transmission rate down, if we can keep this virus contained, we will get through to the other side of it more quickly. And that's what it's going to take. And in the meantime, when people make poor choices, they jeopardize not only the health and safety of others, but the livelihoods of businesses in our community. And I think that's why you're seeing bar owners actually supporting each other in being successful and calling out when they see signs of, of people not taking it seriously because they know it's at risk. They know it's at, at stake. 
This is Bailey with 1011. Is there any talk right now of some bars being shut down or what steps are being taken to, you know, talk with the owners of the bars in the rail yard to investigate that photo that was seen? Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, we are going to try and do everything we can. Our first step is to educate and to collaborate so that we can put safety measures in place. Uh, we know that in, in the rail yard, that was a really direct kind of result of people leaving an event at Pinnacle Bank and uh, flowing into the rail yard. So that was a new situation and maybe we need some new strategies. But I'll, I'll let Director Lopez come up and address your question um, and see if there's any further details she can provide. Hi, Bailey. Uh, just as the mayor said, we, we were able to identify that it was related specifically to this event that occurred downtown. But the other thing is, you know, um, we see one picture from one angle and looking at that. So we are in the process of an ongoing investigation of what really was happening at that time. And as the mayor also indicated, we continue to educate uh, and work with our um, bar owners and they know what's at stake and they are trying to work very hard to make sure they're in compliance, the majority. and and identifying when they see actions that are putting their businesses at risk. But one of the things we do know that makes it really difficult for these business owners is that they need patrons, they need their customers to help them stay open. If we wanna to continue to enjoy that and have that opportunity as customers, please be respectful of the people working in the establishment. Protect them, they're trying to make a living and have employment, they have families, they have bills they need to pay. And so we need to really be considerate of that and remember that what our actions when we're there as customers are impacting this business. Director Lopez, Riley at the Journal Star. I had a dashboard related question or a data related question. Is the health department, um, like maybe some of its other public health peers, tracking um, the active cases versus the overall total? Um, and or is there any plans to include that in the um, data dashboard? You know, uh, we do share all of those that we are monitoring several cases. Um, we do track the actives, but we don't post those on the dashboard at this time. No, we're we're engaged with them. And is there, a, is there a sense for the public and at a given time, what percentage of the overall uh, cases reported to date, the active cases comprise? I mean, is it, well, is it like a third you know, generally of people who would still are considered contagious enough to be active? Okay, so Riley, an easy way to look at that is look at our recovered number. So we report the actual number of cases and then we report the number of recovered and people don't move to recovered until they are no longer symptomatic and they're able to resume their normal activities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Director Lopez, this is Andrew Ozaki from Channel 7 News. I was wondering, do you have any breakdown on how many students have required hospitalization or um, uh, Pen, state pen inmates that have required hospitalization? You know, uh, I can't, uh, the state pen, uh, we work closely with them. They have physicians on staff. They actually have an infirmary there. Uh, I can't honestly say, Andrew, that I'm aware that any of those, uh, those who are isolated or in quarantine from the state penitentiary have been transferred to a hospital here in Lincoln. As far as the students, you know, we have students that um, relocate, maybe go home uh, when they're isolated. I think any numbers that we have, uh, we'd have to make sure in reporting anything that we had an aggregate uh, number of situations before we'd be reporting any individual information to protect the student. This is Bailey with 1011. I have a question for Chancellor Green. 
Um, I doubt that there are many students who are up at 10 a.m. watching this press conference right now. Um, I'm wondering just what's being well, done sure, to communicate. <laughs> I'm wondering what's being done to communicate these things to students and to spread that message to them. Well, thank you for the question, Bailey. Um, uh, I think you would be surprised, actually, how attentive the students are to, to the, the messaging and the communication and the education efforts uh, that the university is take, has taken and has on an ongoing basis. So we, we are communicating regularly with our student body, uh, both in uh, mass, a mass way as well as in targeted ways. Um, on practice, on following practice, on what the procedures and rules really are for our engagement on campus. Um, that has been uh, saturated, I will put it that way. We've, we've done that in a very, very proactive way. Um, I think you're aware that covid19.unl.edu contains much of that information and we continue to message that across the board. Um, you know, the, the uh, other thing I would add that I didn't speak to earlier around the uh, quarantine basis. So we do have eight Greek organizations that are currently under quarantine because there was a, a small emerging cluster in that house and the risk mitigation was appropriate for us to really put our arms around that and to mitigate any risk um, that might exist from further transmission. And in that process, I think uh, Director Lopez spoke to this, you know, the, the uh, Greek organizations may have felt like or felt like all of the attention was on them. Uh, we communicated very uh, openly with all of the Greek organizations earlier this week, all of the fraternities, all of the sororities, and working with them on best practice, working with them for everything to be implemented and uh, paying attention to those details. And I think they fully understand that and are doing that, um, are doing that well. So, uh, so we are communicating very heavily, Bailey, uh, on a daily and ongoing basis with our students, with our faculty, and with our staff. Riley at the Journal Star. Um, tell me a little more, what are the plans for prevalence testing? Are, are faculty and students gonna be sort of randomly uh, tested uh, when that program launches to sort of get a sense for the cases on campus? Yeah, so Riley, we, we have actually been talking about and in our planning for some talking about how we would implement uh, background or prevalence testing across campus. And so our, our plan is this coming week to implement a pr proportion of our on-campus community tested weekly as, uh, as that background mechanism. So we'll, we'll start that on Monday. We don't have those details that we're releasing yet, but th that is our plan, is to do that starting next week. Chancellor Green, at this point in time, how comfortable are you that if we could start fall football, if we could bring back football? Um, <laughs> Andrew, that... I thought I would be through a press briefing and no one would ask me about the Big Ten or about, about a return to competition. Um, you know, it's, I, I won't say anything that, I've, that I haven't already said about this. There is active work by the hour uh, in the Big Ten about how to return to competition, when to return to competition, all of the policies and protocols and procedures, much like we have been talking about here in a much more detailed way for return to competition for fall, what would have been fall sports. And I am very encouraged that we are going to see that happen. And uh, I am very hopeful that we're going to see that happen yet this year. Uh, that we will have a return to competition. So uh, work is going on around the clock. I can't tell you how many hours we have spent just in recent days um, in uh, uh, working on this issue because we want and need to be returning to competition as soon as, as possible. But, but with the numbers you guys just presented, I mean, how, how can you say that we're close to, you know, to being prepared to return to competition? Well, I... Yeah, I, I think that you also have to put that in context, Andrew. So, you know, we, we exist in a footprint of 14 institutions in the Big Ten, 
And there, if you look across those institutions, there are institutions in the Big Ten that have very high caseloads currently. Uh, you can look at Iowa and see that certainly and what's happening uh, to the east of us in Iowa uh, and in some of our other colleagues across the Big Ten. So we, we are first and foremost you know, delivering on our mission academically and making sure that we can do that safely and the athletics return to competition will fall behind that. You know, that is the, is the, the uh, bottom line. But we do feel that we are prepared adequately in thinking about how to do that and how that, how that can occur. And Chancellor, while you're still up there, <laughs> uh, how many students have utilized your uh, quarantine or isolation areas in, in Nyhart uh, um, Residence Center? We, our capacity at Nyhart, um, we are roughly a third of that capacity is under use currently for students who are, are in quarantine using that facility. We certainly have more students who are in quarantine uh, themselves outside of that and didn't need that particular location in order to do it, but about a third of our capacity is currently occupied. And was there any consideration, because I understand that with the Greek housing, okay, if, uh, if you needed to quarantine maybe a small cluster, in order for them to go into that as opposed to just shutting down the entire Greek house, uh, um, in order for them to go into that isolation housing, they would have to pay like 150 bucks a night or something like that. Was there any thought about waiving that so you didn't have to close down an entire Greek house and, and um, make the entire Greek house have to go you know, remotely or quarantine? This, th this is being handled in various ways. So every Greek organization, just a, just a few things for clarity here, first of all, our Greek organizations uh, have houses that many are on the campus they're operated as approved university housing uh, with the university, but owned by alumni corporations and owned by those, those chapters themselves. So they're under the, the control of both the university and their, their alumni boards. We provided them guidance going into the semester that was exactly the same as the universities in terms of housing requirements, meeting the protocols for health uh, considerations for COVID-19. So everyone is under the same premise of operating under those policies across the resident part of our campus, those students who reside uh, in university housing or in Greek and for sorority housing on campus. But only a percentage of the Greek organizations actually live in their house. That's another thing that's important for the public to understand. Uh, a Greek organization may have 200 members, but may only have 30 or 40 members who live in their house on campus. So there's a distinction there that I would just draw to, uh, to uh, uh, be clear. So when the, the eight chapters that have been now put in quarantine or in some stage of quarantine, that's for the house. The students who are living in the house on the campus in order to have that protection and that mitigation around them. So just, just to, to provide a little bit of clarity there. Okay. And uh, Pat, this is Andrew again. How comfortable are you uh, about resuming uh, football in your community? That's a little above my pay grade, Andrew. Andrew. Um, look, we want to make sure that the health and safety of all of our residents, whether they're permanent residents or students who come to our campus to learn and grow or play sports, we want to make sure they're first and foremost safe and having their educational opportunities. I mean, is it heartbreaking for all of us that we aren't resuming life as we knew it in every aspect? Of course, we all want to return to what was familiar before the pandemic, but we're in this pandemic. The only way uh, around it is to go through it. We'll go through it faster if we observe these practices, if we make sacrifices, and unfortunately sacrifices involve just that, sacrifice. We don't get to, there's no easy way around it. But if we are diligent 
if we work together, we'll get through this, and there may be a time sooner rather than later when sports can resume. We certainly want that for our student athletes. Any other questions? Becca Costello with NET News. I have a question probably for Pat. Um, I noticed on the dashboard, it was recently added the average turnaround time for tests um, by various labs. And it looks like the Test Nebraska lab has um, been having some delays. Um, can you talk a little bit about those delays and how long that's been going on? Yes, I'll hand it over to Director Lopez in just a second. I'll say that we wanted to publish this data so that people can make as informed decisions as possible about where uh, test results are being turned around quickly because of course, that time frame is essential in terms of how long you have to quarantine while you wait your results and, and how effective our contact tracing can be. So um, it is really important that we get those times to a minimum, ideally 24 hours. Um, we're seeing the vast majority, about 80% of our test results coming back within three or fewer days. Um, but yes, delays have been a part of this process as everyone works to build capacity to source uh, the resources necessary to do testing and to undertake something that has not been undertaken before. But here we go, Director Lopez can answer more. You know, uh, Test Nebraska is increasing their testing availability, so they've been in the process of hiring additional uh, staffs. And it's also important, you know, average, we usually had a 48-hour turnaround. And right now, um, this morning, it was three days. This is something I check on every morning for different sites, so I can answer that. Um, but then you'll see an average of the time there. It, I think it's really important to remember, too, that we, uh, all across the state, uh, Test Nebraska is the primary testing available in communities. But even more importantly than that, just in Lincoln alone, we've done uh, over 5,000 tests have been distributed to our long-term care and assisted living uh, facilities, and we still have more. So that's occurring all over the state, and all of those tests are also going in to test Nebraska. So they've been developing a priority uh, system, and we are in close contact uh, with them, and we have a state contact that we can uh, visit with as we needed. So that's what's really happening when you're seeing that. Um, I'm thinking that uh, soon we'll hear that they're fully staffed. Uh, you know, it's a great opportunity for people who might be looking for employment in this difficult time that might have those skills. I encourage them to contact CHI and fill out an application or talk to them about their skills. Pat Riley at the Journal Star, before you get too far from the podium. Uh, earlier, you had mentioned a little bit about contact tracing. Have your contact tracers encountered um, any instances, especially maybe young, the, um, among the younger population that's surging or comprising a lot of the cases? Have, have they detected any evasion or sort of efforts to um, you know, not necessarily be forthcoming about their whereabouts in order to protect their mm -hmm. friends or people they're associating with the parties they've been attending. Have, have you uh, heard of any of that kind of um, activity? You know, Riley, that actually does happen. And what I really want to be forthright in saying is that that's what our disease investigation, our nurses are working uh, with these individuals. And we're, we're dotting the dots across the area. So we're able to come back and say, we know where they were, what they were doing, because I think people think if they don't share information, we're not gonna know. But these cases don't, you, you have to be exposed to somebody to, develop, to become positive. And so during that process, eventually we tie all these individuals together. So we encourage people, the majority of people are really open and um, providing information. Uh, a lot of our younger people have uh, multiple questions about what to do. They're concerned, and part of it, you know, part of the reason that these things uh, happen, people might be evasive or not want to get a test, because they're fearful 
of what might happen. And so just as the university has done, we are always uh, reinforcing to them that, you know, they did the right thing getting tested. They're doing the right thing for themselves, their families, in their community. Uh, and doing that and doing the quarantine, and we offer them all the supports we can, and the universities and our colleges are certainly doing that as well. So we want so we that want word to get out to them so that they know they can continue to contact us and, and respond to us. Uh, a quick follow up to that, if you can, this is Becca from NET News again. Do you know an average of how long it takes um, to contact all of those high risk close contacts of a person who tests positive? No, um, I do. Actually, we track that. And so 94%, once we receive a positive case, uh, we've completed that in investigation on 94% of them within 24 hours. Um, sometimes we have the issue where we have some students or some individuals, I'm not going to say students, uh, excuse me, because it's others, and this is a universal situation, that don't contact us. Um, so we use texting uh, also so that they know who's trying to reach them. So we just encourage people, if the health department's contacting you, to respond. I want to thank our health team. They're working seven days a week. Contact tracing doesn't stop on the weekends. The virus doesn't stop on the weekends. And they have been heroic in their efforts um, from the very beginning and really appreciate them. And of course, all the partners that are involved in managing this pandemic. It is taking everyone playing an incredible role, making sacrifices, devoting time and energy and it's a beautiful sight to behold in our community. We are so fortunate to call Lincoln home, to have so many people who are stepping up to work together. And uh, we're proud of the, of the progress students are making. You know, many of them have come from different parts of the country or different parts of the state where there may not have been as the same degree of, of COVID in their communities. And this is a learning process for them. And we recognize that. And we appreciate their quick, their quick study, learning what they need to do to protect themselves and each other. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for joining us for this briefing. Please stay safe, stay well, stay kind, and we'll see you soon.